On Larry King now, he's a timeless talent. It's Meatloaf. I stepped on a coach's foot in the eighth grade, and he screamed, get off my foot, you hunk of meatloaf. And eighth graders think things like that are really funny. I don't rely on the audience for my performance, for my energy. I've always said I can give the same show in front of four trees than I can give in front of 400,000 people. Plus, I've smoked pot one time in the 60s, and I thought there was people in the drawers, and I was opening kitchen cabinets going, okay, I know you're in here, so I can't have that stuff. All next on Larry King Now. to Larry King now. Today, Meatloaf, the Grammy Award-winning singer, songwriter, actor, and Broadway performer. Meatloaf's album, Bat Out of Hell, has sold over 43 million copies worldwide since its 1977 release, making it one of the top five highest-selling albums ever. He's also known for uh, roles in the Rocky Horror Show, picture shows, and Fight Club, as well as the Broadway classics like Hair, and now Meat is headed to the Vegas stage in the second half of Rock Tells and Cocktails presents Meatloaf, which opens on February 13th at the Planet Hollywood Resort and Casino. Great pleasure to welcome. I'll tell you the first time I met and interviewed Meatloaf, you might not remember this. Bob Costas used to do a show called Later, and we decided that he would get a guest for me, I would get a guest for him, and we wouldn't know who the guest was. It was live. He had a just come on cold. I brought him Governor Mario Cuomo, and he brought me Meatloaf. I had no idea who Meatloaf was, and he walked in. I said, my guess is Meatloaf, when you check into a hotel, how do you sign in <laughs> as Mr. Loaf, and what do you do? I, I, you remember that night? I do now. Because they, they uh, for people who don't know, when you do television, they always call it Dupree interviews. So they there always, was none they, for that. No, there was none for that, but they always call. Right. And, and uh, the gentleman that called for the pre-interview started saying, do you remember this? And I'm going, no. Oh, well, that doesn't mean, really mean anything now. You know, my brain is a little slow. Uh, but when you mentioned just now Mario Cuomo, I went, oh, yeah, I remember that now. That was a fun yeah. show. But we had done, when you a were doing radio the, show. a radio show. That's we had right, done we had, that. Uh, we correct. had done a raid down in D.C. We had been, I'd been on your talk show. Before Bat Out of Hell, what was your break in show business? How did you get I, known? Well, How did you I, become Meatloaf? Oh, well, Meatloaf, I, my, it, started, it started with my dad before I was a year old calling me Meat. Because, when I, you know, some babies are born red and they put them under those lights. My, my youngest daughter was born red, and they put her in the lights, and a few hours, she was not red anymore. I stayed red for a long time. So they called so you he meat. Kept, so my dad thought I looked like a piece of meat, so he called me meat. How did it become loaf? I stepped on a coach's foot in the eighth grade, and he screamed, get off my foot, you hunk of meatloaf. And eighth graders think things like that are really funny. <laughs> and so it just continued on like that. They put it on the locker the next day. And, and so my whole high school, people either call me ML or Meatloaf. I hear you do not like to be called a legend. You don't like to be called a superstar. You don't like to be called a musician. What do you like to be called? Meat. Just meat. <laughs> You're an, an actor. I hear you prefer actor. Well, that's my roots. I, I honestly, Larry, I mean, I've learned about music, obviously. I, I'm, you know... I, when I was younger, I, I tried to play guitar, so I learned a few chords, but I could never tune it to sound right. So it was like, my roots are in acting, and I got into acting because I wanted to get out of study hall in high school because they made me be quiet, and my Indian name is Never Shuts Up. And so... Um, <laughs> I, I gather. <laughs> study hall was dry. Yeah, I have no concise answers either, Larry. I don't know. That, that, that short, concise thing doesn't work with me. Um, so I wanted to get out of study hall, and... I, because it was driving me insane. So I went to the counselor, and she goes, you can take drama, and I think, anywhere but this place. So I went into drama, sitting in the back of the class, thinking, okay, I'll sit here. At least I can talk every now and then. So how did music, how did Bad Out of Hell come about? Okay, Bad Out of Hell came about because I went to New York to do Hair on Broadway, and my joke is there, they paid me $12 not to do the nude scene, 
And so they... <laughs> what were you in here? Just uh, a chorus? I sang Aquarius. I did... I was never on stage doing it. I, I sang Aquarius, then I went off stage and did the... They had the moms, all these little bits, and Hubert and Young Recruit and What a Piece of Work is Man and Jim Grant. Yeah. Just... I, I just was off changing clothes. And um, I was doing the nude scene down for the costume people. So I went... They said, you have to have an agent. So I went to an agent named Jeff Hunter. Who, who became, who was Raul's, Julia's agent, who I became good friends with. Great guy. But, oh, great guy. Did two plays with him. So they, he said, you got to work for Joe Papp at the Public Theater. I went down to the Public Theater. I sang a song called I'd Love to Be as Heavy as Jesus. And for this gentleman named Jim Steinman, he got up and said, can you wait here? And as he was passing me, because Jim's got a great sense of humor, he said, you're as heavy as three Jesuses, by the way. <laughs> and uh, left, brought Joe Papp and this army of people back in. I sang a little bit for Joe. He had me sing something else, handed me a script and said, pick out a character. And that's Jim Steinman, and that's how we got batted to hell together. But everybody knew me as an actor. So if I would go to a restaurant in New York, people would come up and go, were you just in As You Like It at, at Shakespeare and at the, at the Delacorte? And I said, I was. They said, great job. And so that was fine. If people come to you, like, that's why I don't want to be a superstar and legend. I like people to respect my work and enjoy my work. And if people come to me and go, I really like what you did, thank you. In the Broadway program, when you're doing a play, it says meatloaf. It does. And I went to Joe Papp, the first Shakespeare I did for Joe. And I, I said to him, Joe, listen, we're doing Shakespeare. Maybe we you know, maybe we shouldn't use meatloaf here. And Joe just looks at me and goes, if Bill was alive today, he would use meatloaf. And I stood there forever going, who the hell is Bill? <laughs> I, and, and all of a sudden, Don, I mean, Bill, we, oh, William, got it. But that was his guy. He way, didn't say anything. You had a rocky me. relationship with Jim Steinman, right? No, we didn't. That's like, you know how press creates this. How did that happen then? Well, Jimmy wanted to be an artist as well. And Jimmy wanted to be, he wanted more recognition for Bad Out of Hell. And I took him everywhere with me. And they just, the recognition went to myself and Carla. And I, I felt bad for Jim. I did everything in the world. I took him to every interview. I took him to every radio. I took him, you know, he opened the show when we were doing Bad, I mean, we did everything. He just, it's like Steven Tyler with Aerosmith or Mick Jagger with the Stones. That's the first, Jim Morrison with the doors. The front man just gets the yeah. recognition. So you're friends with him. Oh, yeah, I talk to him all the time. We're working on a record together. Coming up, what makes Meatloaf performance so special? We'll learn from the man himself. Stay with us. We're back with the great, I can't call him great. No, yeah. you can say great. Oh, I'm back superstar. with the great meat. I don't mind great. Or is it? I like great. Checks into hotels, Mr. <laughs> Loaf. Um, What's the goal? You step on a stage. Uh, the goal? Do you, do you feel them every time when you're singing, when you're performing? No, I don't use the audience. I don't. What do I, you mean? I, I don't. I don't rely on the audience to for my performance, for my energy. I've always said I can give the same show in front of four trees than I can give in front of four hundred thousand people. Uh, four hundred thousand people. I've played in front of four hundred thousand people. There's a lot of energy there. But there's a lot of energy from trees, too. But I don't use that. What That's, do you use? I just, I go, I just go away. I, I go off, I go back to Strasbourg, because I did some work with Strasbourg, um, into his image method, which is, is good to use when you're singing a song, but not necessarily good to use when you're shooting a film with another actor. And I, that's a long explanation. But the images, and I, 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 back to the pre-interview, I explained that I don't like talking on the phone. And so if I talk on the phone, I have to know who I'm talking to and I see their faces. So when I'm singing this song, I'm running a film. And the film, every night, I, how many times I've sang Bad at Hell? I, who knows? 3,000? 4,000? But every night, it's like the first time. Because I get a different film. Why does it still sell like 200,000 copies a year? I, Steinman got inducted into the Songwriters Hall of Fame. And I did an induction speech before he came up to accept his award. And I compared him to the writer Samuel Beckett. 
And I didn't know that Samuel Beckett, and Jim and I have been working together forever, and I never knew Samuel Beckett was his favorite writer. And for me to compare him to Samuel Beckett, he almost fell over. Because Samuel Beckett was a master of the human condition. Sure was. And, and I think that Steinman is exactly the same way. And as Jimmy's gotten older, because Bad at Hell was really about the human condition of adolescence. And it struck a chord. So it doesn't make any difference how old you are. You remember that, whether you were in a horse and buggy and making out in a hay bale or, or you were in the back seat of a Chevy. One of your most famous roles is in Fight, Fight Club, right? I can't even tell you how great it was. There's no words. I don't have the words, the vocabulary to tell you how incredible it was to work with David Fincher and how much I learned from David. How did fame, if, if at all, affect you? Well, I'll tell you how. If, if you want to go to a restaurant and it's booked, you know this, Larry. Yeah. And, and you have somebody call, because I can never do this myself. Right. And, and they, they, they say, oh, I'm sorry, the restaurant's booked. And they go, well, Meatloaf would really like to come tonight. Oh, okay. We could probably get a table for him. That's how, you know, those, it's good for that kind of thing. Or, you know, it's... Did you ever get hooked into drugs or anything? I've smoked pot one time in the 60s, and then one time in the 80s, and I thought there was people in the drawers that were in my, broken into, and I was opening kitchen cabinets going, okay, I know you're in here. So I can't have that stuff, okay? But they, uh, maybe, they, maybe they were. They probably <laughs> were. And, and people have laughed at me going, do you think they were little people? And I said, I knew they was in there. Okay, they were in there. And, I get uh, it, Meat. Yeah. <laughs> Stay away from it. <laughs> uh, but we did lose a great artist in Philip Seymour Hoffman as I a did, fellow actor. Yeah, I did a movie with Philip. What, uh, what movie? It was with Steve Martin. I think it could have been Philip's first movie, I don't know. A movie with Steve Martin called Leap of Faith. It was with Liam Neeson, Deborah Weir. That's right, yeah, I saw it listed in his. And, and so the first, when we first got, we were up in the Panhandle of Texas in some town. They had a Walmart. That was it. And the well, days off, the, the, everybody go, we're going to Walmart today. You want to go? Okay, I'm coming. <laughs> and so, uh, but we checked into this. We all got to this motel, and Philip was in the room right next to me. And all of a sudden, I hear Philip just screaming, going, I can't believe. I mean, he is really screaming. And so I go, well, I don't really know him, but I got to go make sure he's okay. So I go over there, and I go, Philip, are you okay? And he goes, no. And I'm going, well, what's wrong? And he goes, they've taken my scene out. And I'm going, oh, you're kidding. He goes, no. And he goes, and they cut this other one. And I'm going, oh, man, wow. And then all of a sudden, I'm standing there going, I better go check my script. <laughs> I go to my script. They've taken me out. They've cut. They've so cut what out. happened? Well, originally it was an ensemble piece, and we all signed on because it was an ensemble piece. And I lo and they hired Deborah Winger. And Deborah Winger, then what they did was they shifted all this dialogue that all of us, a lot but of But you were had. still in the movie, right? Oh, we're in the movie, but we're not in the movie like what? But Philip Hoffman was not going to be denied. He forced And I was, I was a little, I held back because of Steve Martin and Liam Neeson and Deborah Winger and... But, but Philip, he was bound and determined that that camera was going to see him. And he was very creative, and, and, and the director loved him. The director said, this guy's a talent. And I'm going, well, I could do that too, you know, but I'm kind of <laughs> holding back. But Philip didn't. Great actor, though, wasn't yeah. he? Yeah. Oh. When we come back, Vegas and Meatloaf. I'm going. February 13th, uh, Meatloaf returns to Vegas in Rocktails and Cocktail Z, presenting Meatloaf. What's it like to work there? It's... Singers don't like it. No, that's what I was getting ready to tell you. You know what? I absolutely... I created this show. I put it up on its feet. Um, when I... They called me about doing this show called Rocktails and Cocktails, so I didn't come up with the name. And they kind of had it in, in the mind of doing like a VH1 Storytellers, and I said, well, it's Vegas. We can take it, you can take it, do a lot more with it than that. And uh, so I put this whole thing together and went out and laid it out to them like you would p pitch a television show. And they just kind of stood there going, you know, that could change how Vegas does shows from now. And I'm going, oh, yeah, right, I believe that. And so um, 
but I just came up with, because I love vaudeville, and so, and I've studied, I've read about vaudeville, and I know a lot of the jokes, and I've put in. So is it a vaudevillian show? No, it it's a, when the rock songs come on, I do the meatloaf rock guy, and he disap, and everybody disappears. It's like when I shoot a film. As long as they're rehearsing, like the cameras and everybody are there, but the minute they say action, there's nobody in the room except me and the actor. You interact with the audience, I understand. I interact with the audience. Um, I do, I tell them, the beginning of the show is I tell them all the things I don't have. Meanwhile, what's going on is they're all behind me. I can't wait to see this. By the way, tell me your endorsement of Mitt Romney. You'd never entered politics much openly before. What well, led to no, that? No, not openly. Not openly. I am a true independent. I walked the streets from a govern, uh, what, in 72, and passed and put flyers in all the New York apartments. And then I did the same thing for Carter. Then when Reagan came around, I was very un... I wasn't sure about Reagan. But then the second term, I voted for Reagan, and then I voted for Bush, then I voted for Clinton both times, played the Clinton number well, one... Well, you Clinton. are an independent. I played the number one Clinton ball. Then when Bush came, I actually voted for Bush, and I knew Al Gore, and it was like a real... To I'm going, ah, this is a toss-up here. And then I hosted the California ball with Marie Osmond, for Bush Jr. I've hosted a Democratic freshman Congress dinner. I've hosted a Republican freshman Congress dinner. I voted for Obama the first time, was very disappointed. And then I really liked Mitt Romney. And when I met, I, we did two songs. Uh, we, we had done a show the night before, and I usually don't sing the next day. But uh, they called me and said, can you come down? We're in Ohio. You're not very far away. So we went on stage. We did two songs. They were very, very good. But I said, the only way I'm going to do it is if I get to talk to Mitt, uh, bef uh, or go you know, Governor Romney before, and I did. And I, I, I talked to him because I think China is a major concern for us as far as all the debt they hold. And, and then I talked to him about job creation. I talked to him about how did he think he could, uh, you know, move the economy. And he, he was very, he gave me concise answers, which was good because he should know how to do that. And, but I'd heard some of it before, but there was a couple of new spins in there. And so I said, great, let's go on. So I how, did two songs. How have you moved so much? I mean, there are not many people who voted McGovern and Bush. I, I mean, I, I've heard of independence, yeah. <laughs> but that's kind of a yeah, swing. Yeah, McGovern and Bush, yeah, well, you know, it's just like, well, McGovern, that was an easy one. I didn't like Nixon at all. I mean, I, you know, and then I was proved really right on that one. <laughs> <laughs> I would say. I was really right on that one. So, I, you know, I just listened to them, to them talk. And, 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 uh, Who are you going to be for in 16? Supposing it's Hillary. You voted for her husband twice. I did. And, you know, that, that, it, it's like, I don't know. I don't, I, I have to, I got to, I have to hear him talking. It don't I, look like it's going to be Christy. Uh, well, that's a shame. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm, I'm sorry that if he put his noose in a, put his head in a noose, <laughs> well, you know? Well, if he knew about it, he put his head in a noose. Did he know about it for sure? If, I said if. Yeah, because I really like him, because I really like the fact that he's really not wishy-washy. I mean, he really goes, okay, this is what I think, and this is what we're going to do. That's why they think, that's why they think he knew about it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Anyway, we'll, we may know. Anyway, yeah. Meatloaf, we're going to break. And when we come back, we're going to take questions for you from the social media. And we're going to play a game of If You Only Knew. We'll be right back with Mr. Loaf. After this. <laughs> we're back with Meatloaf. A lot of social media questions for you, Meat. Okay. Nicholas A. Cray on Facebook. At the beginning of the You Took the Words Right Out of My Mouth video, you did, what did you mean by on a hot summer night would you offer your throat to the wolf with the red roses? I what have does no that idea. mean? You have no, <laughs> no I don't know. Nobody knows. It's just poetic. Was that a marijuana night? Or no, it wasn't just, a marijuana <laughs> It may have been for Jim, not uh, for me. Okay. <laughs> John Davis on Facebook said, I saw an episode of Sci-Fi Channel's Ghost Hunters where you went on investigation. What interests you about the paranormal? Well... The, I, I actually 
saw a ghost in, uh, oh, I've seen several now. Because um, we were talking about Bon Jovi a second ago. But I saw a ghost when we were shooting, uh, when we were uh, recording Bad Out of Hell. And it looked like a real person. It just looked, if somebody came across this room, walked across, you'd go, there's a person walking across. And she walked across the balcony. She was in white. She was a blonde teenager. And I went downstairs. She said, one of Todd Rundgren's groupies down there. And they go, why don't you get up there? And I go, well, I don't know. Came up the back stairs. And they said, there's no back stairs. I said, well, there's a girl up there. Everybody went up there. There's nobody up so there. So you questioned it. And then, then I was at a hotel in London called The Landmark. And about 6.30 in the morning, I, I woke up. I kind of rolled over. And there was kind of a, a guy passing through the room. And I, I said something to him, but he didn't acknowledge me, which means he wasn't an intelligent haunting. And then we were talking about John. John had said to me, uh, Bon Jovi, he had checked into this hotel in Scotland. And he, the whole band checked out in the middle of the night. So when I found that out, I went to that hotel. They saw a ghost? I guess they saw something. So I said, I want John Bon Jovi's room when he was here. So I went up there. I got nothing. I was really disappointed. So ghost hunters, I... Uh, there's been some things happen on Ghost Hunters when I've been on that they've never had happen before. So I love Ghost Hunters. John DePrado on Facebook. Is a movie among your plans? Oh, uh, yeah. I actually forgot. We I have one uh, that's actually at the South by Southwest this year. Gina Gray on Facebook. Do you have any input into the designs of your jackets that you wear on stage? And where do you get the inspiration from? Oh, yeah. I have all the... Uh, yeah, I have all input on the designs the the girl who has done them uh, you know they always give you like a choice of three different designs and then I go from there and I go well look let's add this rose here let's do that I mean but basically I get people that know more than I do about all, everything if you do a duets album who'd you like to work with would you consider Engelbert Humperdinck yeah why not I'm gonna we, we want to do a, a Christmas duets which we've got kind of pencil in and Garth is, said he would do it, and Reba said she would do something, and and Julia Julia Armand has said she. About Humperdinck. It. Yeah. He's good. Yeah. Facebook user Ricky Mark. Martin is who I, I want. Ricky Martin and my I daughter. Yeah. Facebook user Mark Webster asks, "Bad Out of Hell was your signature album, a rock and roll classic. Is there another album or a song by another artist you've heard and said, I wish I had done that?'" Oh yes, yeah. Uh, Hotel, uh, the song Hotel California, written by Don Henley. Great song. Oh, it's, see, because, I, they, you know, with things where, because I've never read where Don has ever said what the song was about, and it allows you to be in that hotel and imagine your own room and whatever. Chris Waney on Facebook, favorite tour play, favorite place you toured? Well, I love New York, uh, but I'll tell you the two the two places that were amazing to tour were Berlin before the wall went down and like 19th century, because... West Berlin. West Berlin, yeah, before the wall went down because, and, and Belfast when it was still in the there's early 80s and 70s because those people came to a show and acted like they didn't know if they were going to live tomorrow. So they just went completely crazy. So those two audiences I knew about. Wow. That, that's great. I got Kate Kosi 80 via Twitter. Is there a possibility of another Bat Out of Hell album? The, uh, no. We always knew there would only be three Bat Out of Hells, but Jim Steinman and I are working again on this record. He's, we've got, uh, I've got four songs now and, and I'm, and he's, and he wrote me two days ago. I'm working on another one. So it's, we could have five and then the others are writers that I've relied on, uh, Rick uh, Brantley, Sean McConnell, and uh, Barry Dean, and James, the guy named James Michael. Liesl Smith on Twitter wants to know, what's the one thing you wouldn't do for love? Um, I don't know. If my, if my wife, whatever my wife, listen, trust me, uh, anybody that's in a relationship, I'm going to look right at the camera and say this, anybody that's in a relationship, just remember this, if you're a man, the woman is always right, so you'll do anything. Correct. And my other tip is, when you get up in the morning, just turn over and say, I'm sorry. It'll cover <laughs> yesterday and whatever occurs that day. A uh, little game of you only knew. First person you ever kissed. 
Oh, oh, that was easy, but it was two. Uh, Judy and uh, oh no, I had my I had my first twosome in the fifth grade in the backseat of my mother's car. Menage a trois. Oh yeah, baby. What were their names? Judy and Janet. You kissed them both. Oh yeah, and the windows were off. We were out. My mother taught school, and I was in the same. So I had to go early when she did. And Judy and Janet showed up, and so we got in the backseat and made out. You ever find they, out what they, happened to them? Um. Nope. Where was this? What city? They were never the same because I was voted best kisser in the seventh grade. What city? In Dallas. B uh, proudest moment? Oh, uh, the birth, uh, my daughters. Most embarrassing moment? I was splitting my pants on, on live TV in Germany and not knowing it, and I don't wear underwear. <laughs> if you had another nickname other than Meatloaf. But that's really how I got my name, Meat. That's my joke. Anyway, go ahead. <laughs> Would you like another nickname? Meatloaf, something else. Oh, uh, listen, I, if if I could have gotten rid of Meatloaf, I would have. Um, but, but you it, can't. Come I on. I can't. No, but Sherry, I, I'm going to tell you a story. Sherry Lansing on Leap of Faith, she actually, she was running Paramount, and she actually called me to her office, and I thought she was going to offer me another role, but she said, we want to not use Meatloaf. And I said, great. And so we were in a screening with Steve Martin for Leap of Faith, and at the end, the credits were rolling by, and Steve goes, who's Michael Lea Day? And so he goes, that's Meatloaf. And he turns to Sherry, and she was there, and he goes, hey, you put Meatloaf up there. And I went, okay. So You're a great man, Meat. So that's, uh, no, there's nothing else. I do have a nickname, though. What is it? Fireball. No kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'll see you in Vegas. Okay. A huge thanks to my guest, Meatloaf, and don't miss him in Rock Tells and Cocktails. It presents Meatloaf. It opens on February 13th at the Planet Hollywood Resort and Casino. And remember, you can find me on Twitter at King's Things. <laughs>